Hello, YouTube. I'd like to read a particular passage from Isaiah chapter 14, which I've seen addressed on YouTube before, but not exactly like this. I'm going to read from verses 12 through 15 uh, from the New Jewish Publication Society translation. And I'm also going to leave some Hebrew words untranslated for emphasis. How you are fallen from heaven, O Hillel, son of Shahar. How you are felled to earth, O vanquisher of nations. Once you thought in your heart, I will climb to the sky. Higher than the stars of El, I will set my throne. I will sit in the mount of assembly on the summit of Zaphon. I will mount the back of a cloud. I will match El Yom. Instead, you are brought down to Sheol, to the bottom of the pit. Now, I think it's fairly clear, based upon uh, terminology employed in what, in its current context, is a taunt directed towards the king of Babylon, um, originally comes from Canaanite mythology. And I thought I'd read some selections from that mythology to illuminate what some of these terms are, are referring to, or at least the background. Now, regarding the language of the Mountain of Assembly, now, this is on page 41. The pages did depart, they stayed not. Then indeed, they set their faces toward the Mount of Lel, towards the full convocation. The gods also had sat down to eat, the sons of the Holy One to dine, and Baal was standing by El. So, in this case, you know, the, the mount of the assembly of the gods is El's mountain, Lel. So, some further language regarding uh, the mountain of assembly on page 58. Mightiest Baal replied, the rider on the clouds responded, saying, They stood up and abased me. They arose and spat upon me amid the assembly of the sons of the gods so which can also be translated sons of El. So again, it's referring to El's mountain, uh, not Baal's mountain. Now, uh, regarding Mount Zaphon, uh, which is Baal's mountain, and uh, in this passage is where the mountain of the assembly of the gods resides. So this is on page 76. And uh, this is in the middle of a story where Baal is battling the god of death, Mot. And at this point, Baal's actually been killed. Um, later in the passage, he actually is raised back to life. Um, but at this point, Athtar is attempting to usurp Baal's place on his throne. Thereupon, Athtar the Terrible went up into the recesses of Zaphon. He sat on the seat of mightiest Baal, but his feet did not reach the footstool. His head did not reach its top. And Athtar the Terrible spoke, I cannot be king in the recesses of Zaphon. So, in this literature, Zaphon is Baal's mountain. Whereas, in the passage in Isaiah, it seems to be saying that Zaphon is... El Yon's mountain, the Most High, which is El. Interestingly enough, there is another passage in the Hebrew Bible um, which equates Zaphon with Zion, Yahweh's mountain. Um, this is from Psalm chapter 48, uh, verses 1 through 2. Great is Yahweh, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the recesses of Zaphon, the city of the great king. Now, regarding the El Yon language, uh, which I mentioned before, most high. There is an instance of this being used uh, in the Canaanite literature. Uh, it's page 98 of this book. A source of blessing to the earth was the reign of Baal, and to the fields the reign of the Most High. A delight to the earth was the reign of Baal, and to the fields the reign of the Most High. 
So the term Elyon is being used to refer to Baal in that case. Whereas in the case in Isaiah, it seems to be referring to El, you know, the high god of the Canaanite pantheon. And there's actually a couple of different ways in which other Hebrew literature uses this term. Uh, one example would be from Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 through 9, which read, When Elyon apportioned the nations, when he divided humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Yahweh's portion was his people. Jacob is allotted share. So, in this case, it seems that Yahweh and Elyon are distinct from one another, and that Elyon, the Most High, is on the first tier of the pantheon, while Yahweh is a junior deity. He's among the sons of God. Another example of how Elyon is used in the Hebrew literature can be found in 2 Samuel 22, uh, which is also Psalm 18. So this is from verses 14 through 16. Yahweh thundered from heaven. Elyon uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of Yahweh, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. So in this case, um, Yahweh is equated with Elyon, rather than them being distinct. Now, getting to uh, Hillel, son of Shahar. Uh, Shahar is a deity um, attested to in the uh, Canaanite literature, and I'm going to read the account of his birth. This is on pages 124 through 126. El went out to the shore of the sea and advanced to the shore of the ocean. El perceived two women moving up and down, two women moving up and down over a basin. One moved down, the other moved up. One cried, Father, Father, and the other cried, Mother, Mother. The organ of El grew long as the sea, and the organ of El as the flood. The organ of El did grow long as the sea, and the organ of El as the flood. So this would be literally translated hand, but as in other Hebrew literature, it's being used euphemistically. El took the two women who moved up and down. He took the two women who moved up and down over the basin. He took them and set them in his house. The two women became wives of El, wives of El even forever. He stooped and kissed their lips. Behold, their lips were sweet, sweet as pomegranates. In the kissing there was conception. In the embracing there was pregnancy. They travailed and gave birth to Shahar and Shalim, which can also be translated as dawn and dusk. Thus we get Hillel son of Shahar, or day star, or shining one, son of dawn, in Isaiah 14. Now, there isn't anything in the extant Canaanite literature which refers to Hillel. So, it could have been, but it's lost, or it just didn't exist. Um, but I think what's most interesting about this passage in Isaiah is that it's using Canaanite mythology, and it's using it allegorically in this taunt directed towards the king of Babylon. You know, it's creating the analogy of, you know, just like Hillel, in his arrogance, you know, attempted to usurp El's throne, and his throne from the heavens to the ground, so shall the king of Babylon be, you know, who's, who's attempting to usurp Yahweh's place. While the Isaiah passage appears to use this mythology allegorically, the Gospel of Luke seems to refer to this as an actual historical event and as referring to Satan, where it appears in the original context had nothing to do with Satan. 
Um, this is how Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19 read. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Now, while this does not seem to have a direct parallel with Isaiah chapter 14, there is other literature uh, which seems to have parallels to this. This is from the book of 2 Enoch, chapter 29. It says, Here Satanael was hurled from the height together with his angels. And also from chapter 31. So this is God speaking here. And the devil understood how I wished to create another world so that everything could be subjected to Adam on the earth and reign over it. The devil is of the lowest places, and he will become a demon because he fled from heaven. So Tona, because his name was Satanael. In this way he became different from the angels. His nature did not change, but his thought did, since his consciousness of righteousness and sinful things changed. And he became aware of his condemnation and of the sin which he sinned previously. And that is why he thought up the scheme against Adam. In such a form he entered paradise and corrupted Eve. But Adam he did not contact. But on account of her nescience, I cursed him. Additionally, this is from a book called The Life of Adam and Eve. Groaning, the devil said, O oh Adam, all my enmity, jealousy, and resentment is towards you, since on account of you I was expelled and alienated from my glory, which I had in heaven in the midst of the angels. On account of you I was cast out upon the earth. Adam answered, What have I done to you? What fault do I have against you? Since you have not been harmed or injured by us, why do you persecute us? The devil answered, Adam, what are you saying to me? On account of you, I was cast out from heaven. When you were formed, I was cast out from the face of God and was sent forth from the company of the angels. When God blew into you the breath of life and your countenance and likeness were made in the image of God, Michael led you and made you worship in the sight of God. The Lord God then said, Behold, Adam, I have made you in our image and likeness. Having gone forth, Michael called all the angels, saying, Worship the image of the Lord God, just as the Lord God has commanded. Michael himself worshipped first. Then he called me and said, Worship the image of God Jehovah. I answered, I do not have it within me to worship Adam. When Michael compelled me to worship, I said to him, Why do you compel me? I will not worship him who is lower and posterior to me. I am prior to that creature. Before he was made, I had already been made. He ought to worship me. Hearing this, the other angels who were under me were unwilling to worship him. Michael said, Worship the image of God. If you do not worship, the Lord God will grow angry with you. I said, If he grows angry with me, I will place my seat above the stars of heaven, and I will be like the Most High. Exact words from Isaiah 14. Then the Lord God grew angry with me and sent me forth with my angels from our glory. On account of you, you, we were expelled from our dwelling into this world and cast out upon the earth. Now, both the second Enoch and the life of Adam and Eve appear to be contemporaneous with the New Testament writings. So, it seems that, you know, in both the case of these, 
non-canonical writings that are not accepted as authoritative by anyone, and in the case of the New Testament, we are seeing a reinvention of the original text. But reinvention is a topic which will require another video.